It's like you guys are alive. Do you see us on Facebook Live, Jillian? See, there is a video going. Currently, Seth Myers is talking about voting. So, okay. <laughs> it will convert to us shortly. But we're, we're going to the, you know, the previews. Back when we had a VHS, that's what this is. The previews. There is also a bit of a delay between it streaming or it getting your, um, your video and it actually going to Facebook. Okay, great. It's hard to say hello to people when we don't know who has signed on. <laughs> Just click on attendees. I see a whole list of people. Welcome, Alexa and Carl Wickstrom and Don Jelly and Denise and Ed Gage, Michelle. Michelle again. Hi. Ooh. Philip, Renee, Sally. Yeah, lots of people logging in. Welcome. Fantastic. <laughs> We're glad you made it tonight. Hello to Renee. It's seven. Should we start? It's just about seven. Yeah, we could give it a minute. If we have any announcements, this would probably be a good time. Do you have any, Laura? I have a whole spiel. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to hear the, hear the spiel. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'll start. Um, so welcome to the Exeter Historical Society's August virtual program. Thank you for join us, joining us. Once again, we hope that you are well. Tonight, our curator, Barbara Rimkunis, is going to discuss the suffrage and anti-suffrage women's movements in observation of the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. A mouthful. If it seems familiar, it may be because she presented this program at our January 2019 program, or you may be familiar with it because of our Exeter History Minute on the topic of anti-suffragists in Exeter. I can put the link to the History Minute on our Facebook page, or you can find it on our website by clicking on the Women of Exeter button on our History Minute webpage. If you are a member of the society, thank you. If you aren't, please consider becoming a member. You can find membership information on our website as well. That's www.exeterhistory.org. All support is welcome and appreciated. And 
just a reminder, our May program will also be held via Zoom, but in September, on September 1st at 7 p.m. We hope you can make that. You can find the link to register on our website or Facebook page, or you can watch it on our Facebook page or Exeter TV's YouTube channel. Barbara will be taking questions during and after the program. Our trustee, Jillian Price, will be monitoring the Q&A dialog box at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to type your questions there. If you're listening on Facebook or YouTube, you can write your questions in the comments and we'll try to get to those as well. And of course, my dog is slurping away over there. <laughs> Lastly, if you, um, sorry, if you would have any issues or Sorry, if you have any issues or would prefer to watch this program in another way, again, you can navigate to our Facebook page, Exeter TV's YouTube channel, or um, Exeter TV channel 98. So I'm going to just toss it over to Barbara now. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. We're all in different places, which is such a strange thing to do, but you know, I think we're getting used to it at this point. So I'm over at the Exeter Historical Society building. Once we're open again, you can visit us here on Front Street in Exeter in the land of the Squamscots, and I would welcome you to come in and do research. If you have general questions, you can always send us an email at info at exeterhistory.org or check our website at www.exeterhistory.org because there's lots of good materials on there. So I'm going to start by just introducing this as, um, you know, we thought about when we were going to do this program again, we thought it would be fun to do it online. And Laura reminded me that the big date, the big date when women's suffrage passes in the United States for the full country is August 20th. And we are at the 100th anniversary of that event. So we thought we better get this in quickly because, you know, Thursdays are coming. So we thought we'd get it in tonight. I'm going to start by sharing my screen so I can bring you the PowerPoint that's got all the pictures on it. Let's see if that's going to work. Here we go. Let me get rid of this. And we'll put it at the first slide here. Okay, you should be seeing the opening slide. Give me a nod, somebody. So I know you're seeing it. Yes, it's there. Okay, this is a very fuzzy picture. But keep that image in your head because that was the program for a big event that was held the day before the inauguration in 1913. Uh, women seemed to cluster around the inauguration for their major marches and events. In Washington, D.C., they knew that that was going to be a day when everyone would be in town and they were about to inaug uh, inaugurate. That's not a word. They were about to swear in Woodrow Wilson as president. So they staged a huge march that day. But that's not what started my interest in this story. Um, here at the Historical Society, we get donations in quite frequently. And way back in like 2005, in among a big collection from the Perry Dudley families, I found stationery, about 10 or 11 sheets of stationery. And this is what it said. And I looked at it and thought, the New Hampshire Association opposed to women's suffrage with Mrs. A.T. Dudley of Exeter as the president. Well, I was horrified. I mean, in my rose glass world of the view of the world, I had imagined that the only people that ever opposed women's suffrage were probably a group of white men who looked like Archie Bunker. That was, you know, that was my image of who would oppose something like this. I don't know, maybe tennis player Bobby Riggs. There, I had a few people in my head who I thought would oppose women's suffrage but never a Mrs. Dudley. So who was this woman? Here she is. Frances Perry Dudley was um, married to a man who worked at the academy. So she was an upper crust lady in Exeter. She lived in one of those three fine houses in the downtown of Exeter that looks over the square of the town. Uh, so she was very much a, a, a fine, well-to-do woman. And she didn't have to work for a living. Her husband and her family means supported her. So why would she oppose 
suffrage. Why would a woman who has everything not want to be her own person? Why would she not want the vote? I, I couldn't believe it. I'd never heard of anti-suffrage movements before. And so this is what began a little bit of a journey into trying to understand better how the suffrage movement went. So what I'm gonna do tonight is I'm gonna talk about the general suffrage movement in the United States, but more specifically, because I think it's always good to go local because I work for local history. I wanna make sure that we have a good understanding of how suffrage went down in the state of New Hampshire, and even more specifically in the town of Exeter, particularly since it appears that this particular person here, Francis Perry Dudley, was the head of the anti-suffrage group for the state. Here's our state hero of the night. This is actually uh, Armenia White. Armenia White really starts the women's suffrage movement in the state of New Hampshire, and she stays with it right up until her death. Um, she is uh, as much a founding figure for New Hampshire's fight for suffrage as you would say that uh, Susan B. Anthony is for the national movement. She was born in 1817, and she was a Quaker, became a universalist later on in her life when she married. She um, introduced the idea of she was, she was originally a temperance worker, and as we'll see, a lot of women were moved in the, in the temperance movement, the anti-alcohol movement. And she felt that you needed to move on from there and be concerned also about enslaved people and also freedom for women. So these were the three guiding principles of her life. And of course, they were the three guiding principles of most of the women who fought for suffrage. Women were politically active. This is something that we, we tend to forget. We, we tend to think that before women had the vote, that women's voices were not heard, that women had nothing to do with any types of politics. What you're seeing is a document that we have in our collections here at the Historical Society. It's from 1834, as someone penciled in at the very top. And it's a petition that was sent to the United States Congress in 1934, requesting that they abolish slavery in the District of Columbia. These petitions were sent there because it was felt that in a country that was that prided itself on freedom and independence, when visitors came to the United States and they landed in Washington, DC, they would land at the docks and the first thing they would see were slave auctions because it was a major point where enslaved people would be brought in from the West Indies or directly from Africa. So uh, it really looked bad <laughs> for one thing. And for another, a lot of people uh, in the North in particular were opposed, were opposed to the idea of slavery. And the reason I'm giving that a funny look is because if you talk about abolitionism in the North, you have to be a little cautious. Um, extreme abolitionists who wanted to eliminate slavery all across the United States were uh, not that common, and they were also people who um, everyone else considered to be a little bit irritating, sort of the way that we think of animal rights activists who can be very, very vocal sometimes, and you're like, oh, for crying out loud, let's worry about people first. You know how that, that can go. And a lot of people back then would roll their eyes the way that I just did, but they'd say, well, you know, I don't like slavery, it's a bad thing, but, you know, Constitution says it's legal, and it only exists in the South, so we don't have to worry about it. Well, of course, the fact that it existed only in the South was number one, not true. And also, um, that doesn't mean that people in the Northern states weren't participating in it. Exeter certainly participated in enslavement of people for a variety of ways. For one thing, the state never really officially outlaws slavery. Um, although slaves, uh, enslaved people are not on the census after about 1830 or 40. Um, but also, every time we opened a new cotton manufacturing company, all of that cotton came, it was all planted and grown and harvested and processed by enslaved hands before it came up here. So we were participating. What's interesting about this particular petition, however, it's not so much that it is a, an abolitionist petition, it's that it's signed entirely by women, women who have no political voice technically because they can't vote. They can't participate legally in that way. However, they were allowed to legally sign petitions. We've taken this and we did look through it to try and figure out if this was something that was sponsored by one of the churches in town, 
Um, it doesn't appear to be. There are women who have signed from all over. They're from a variety of different denominations. The other interesting thing about this document is you'll, you'll notice that the women are all signing their full names. No one is signing Mrs. Michael Ernest. They're all signing it with their own first names, which gives us an understanding that women, although they frequently did have to hide behind their spouse's names, they did have an understanding that they, they were people, that they had agency in this regard. The women's suffrage movement is completely entangled and enmeshed with two other movements. The first of these is the temperance movement. Now, in order to understand the temperance movement, you, you have to understand a few things. First of all, it's very important to know how much alcohol was out there. I mean, it was enormous. The amount of alcohol that was drunk on a daily basis um, per capita is, is just tremendous. And um, they'd water it down for the children. But even going back to the colonial period in New England, there's just a lot of rum and a lot of ale. And although drinking wasn't necessarily against uh, like Puritan rules, drunkenness was. And it affected many different things. It affected the way that people worked. It affected the way that town government ran because they would take breaks to go down to the tavern and drink. Um, and it really affected family life. Now at this time, this is 1829, you're seeing a, a temperance society booklet that we have in our collections. And um, women were behind this a lot because they're very dependent on their spouses at this point in time. Once a woman got married, she no longer legally existed. The marriage was considered uh, to be one person and that one person was the husband. He had control over finances. He had control over the children. Should they need to get a divorce, divorce was legal, but it was extremely hard to do. And women tended to take the fall on that one and they'd lose control of any property they had and they'd lose control of their children. And so uh, it wasn't something that many people resorted to except at you know, great, great need. So if, if a husband was drinking too much um, and could not, it, it could be a real problem. So the temperance movement began in the United States and starts to gain a lot of steam. And women joined the temperance movement early on. In 1848, move forward here. We're gonna move from the temperance movement to the earliest women's rights movement, which we can look at as being in 1848 at the Seneca Falls Convention that took place in New York State. The Seneca Falls Convention had a lot of uh, you know, well-known suffrage women, uh, Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, and there they drafted something called the Declaration of Sentiments. Now the original document that everyone signed has mysteriously disappeared as sometimes happens, but it, it outlined a lot of the things that women were looking for. And if you read through this, what you can understand from it is, is how much women, how many rights women did not have based on what they're asking for. I have to switch from one dark pair of glasses to another here, so, okay. Here's what they were asking for. They stated right out, laws should not interfere with the happiness of women. Women should have freedom of conscience and station and are not inferior to men. Woman is man's equal. That was a very revolutionary idea back then. Women need to learn the laws and claim their rights. Men believe they are intellectually superior, women morally superior. She should be allowed to speak in public and at church. It's very frustrating to women that, that, that they would be told that men are intellectually superior to them, but women were the moral guidance. Women were there to teach the children the right path. They were the ones who could influence their husbands and spouses and brothers, but they didn't get a direct say in what was going on. Women are well behaved. They said yes, but men should be too. Originally when they were about to vote on the, on the um, Declaration of Sentiment, one of the things that they debated heavily was the question of suffrage. Should women be allowed the right to vote? And an awful lot of the women there were not comfortable 
signing their name to something that included women's suffrage. It was just considered too out there. It just sounded crazy. It's, it just was too disturbing. And it was um, something that was very much going to unsettle family life. The one person who convinced them to put it in, and by the way, the person who really wanted it was Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She was quite the rebel. And she was going to concede and not put it in until Frederick Douglass insisted they put it in. Of all people, Frederick Douglass was there, and he recalled that when he uh, was escaping from slavery, the people who reached out to him and the people who helped him along his, his way tended to be women. So he knew that they were powerful people, they were principled people, and he knew that they would make good decisions when it came to laws. He insisted that they put it back in. So they did. And it was signed, and it was an incredibly unusual document for its time. Um, just the fact that you had a large gathering of women and men, as you can see, there were men there as well, and the women would speak in public was unusual because women hadn't been allowed to speak in public. They weren't allowed to speak in their churches. They weren't allowed to speak in front of groups. And all of this begins to change during the 19th century gradually, little by little, as individual women who are willing to get up and speak and say things like, you know, I should have the right to vote. And as laws change in various states, maybe women are allowed to own property. Uh, married women are allowed to own property eventually. Um, up until that time, a married woman couldn't own property. The husband owned all of her property. The only way she owned property was if she was a widow or sometimes she could inherit it, but then it was usually looked over by a brother. So once she was able to own things um, and pay taxes, she would be taxed on all of this. Why would she not have the right to vote after all? Isn't that why we split off from uh, Great Britain in the first place, taxation without representation? Women had a little bit of a foothold when you talk about that kind of thing coming up. Through the 19th century, Various um, women's organizations and women's suffrage groups come into being. They shift back and forth. There, there are all sorts of different things. There's a New York State Temperance Society. Uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton get together. And uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was a married woman who had many, many children, was frequently uh, not can't, just couldn't couldn't leave the house because she had so many kids. So she would do the writing and. Um, and Susan B. Anthony, who was a single woman, would go out on the road and she would do the speeching, speeching. She would do the speaking. As a Quaker, she had always been allowed to speak in her own church. So I think she was more comfortable with it, even than Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who came from a Unitarian Universalist background. So temperance unions and suffrage associations tended to join together. And then the Civil War happens. The Civil War uh, brings with it the abolition of slavery. I think we have our two ladies here. Here's Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Susan B. Anthony, many of you may remember from the coin. <laughs> Elizabeth Cady Stanton is less known. Both of these women, I mean, you can, we, we admire them for their work on women's suffrage. Uh, you know, at times you can, uh, you, they can be criticized for other things uh, that they did. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, like she wrote a women's Bible that many people saw as heresy later in her life. That was troublesome. And the women's suffrage movement on the whole is going to have some racist problems um, as we go through, and we'll address those as they come along. During the Civil War, the suffrage movement takes a back seat, as does the temperance uh, movement, takes a back seat to simply winning the war. Most of the women who were, had been agitators or who had been politically motivated to take a step back during the war so that they can participate more in um, the sanitary commissions and supporting what was going on on the battlefield. And they proved very capable of doing this. It's interesting that anytime there's some sort of war event, some sort of military event going on, women managed to step up and do the sorts of things that they had been convinced by society, from by one another, that they weren't capable of doing. And yet they do manage to do it. After the Civil War, there's three amendments that get passed after the Civil War. The 13th Amendment, which I don't have here, uh, but the 13th Amendment is the amendment that outlaws slavery. And then, and that's passed in 1865. In 1868, 
the 14th Amendment is passed. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the, of the state where they reside and of the United States. That was important uh, because one of the, um, t during the 1840s or 50s, I can't recall which it is, the Fugitive Slave Act gets passed on the basis of a decision called the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott was a man who had been enslaved. He's brought into a state that does not have slavery, and there he tries to sue for his freedom. And he is denied it at the Supreme Court level because he is not considered a citizen of the United States. So this particular amendment is defining who is a citizen. It also brings to the front the idea of birthright citizen because it starts out with all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject, subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. We're one of the countries in the world that has birthright citizenship. If you're born here, you are immediately a citizen. Um, so that's important. Now, although this particular amendment also guarantees due process of law, and it doesn't deny anybody equal protection of the laws, it seems like it would include voting because it says due process of law, right? That you are a citizen, you should be allowed this. Unfortunately, the um, section two does sort of specify that it's male voting. So you had to be male to vote. So just when women would think, well, perhaps we're gonna have it, gets pulled out of their grasp. And then a few years later, they begin to, to actually debate in Congress the idea of whether or not you should be allowed to vote. And this is where women really thought they were going to get the vote. In fact, they, they worked hard to try and convince Congress that extending the franchise to, um, to African Americans should also extend it to women as well. They really pushed hard for it, but unfortunately, and this is where Frederick Douglass let them down. He said, let's do this first and then we'll work on women's suffrage. And um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was just furious over this decision, but it did not include women. It doesn't actually say that, but it didn't include women. Now remember that voting is also something that is, is a, a state or uh, it, you know, it's governed by the states. Here's the 15th Amendment. I always put this up here to say, yeah, look at all the men. <laughs> men deciding that men can vote. <laughs> uh, who doesn't get a say in it? Uh, what they are kind of showing in this particular print is that there are people of different racial backgrounds involved in the decision-making with Ulysses S. Grant there sitting in the center and John Brown hanging over his head in that portrait. Um, so there's a lot of people going on in here. However, it wasn't enough. Um, sometimes governance happens this way. It doesn't happen the way you want it to go. There are a lot of concessions made. Thaddeus Stevens said, the greatest, the greatest measure of this 19th century was passed by corruption, aided and abetted by the purest man in America. He said that of emancipation. So sometimes that's, that's just how things go. Doesn't mean that the ladies were gonna give it up. Now I'm gonna take a brief second here to just go over what happens in the temperance movement at this point so that we won't, no, oh, maybe I don't. Sorry, updated this, no, I do. Okay, here we go. Let's see whatever happened to temperance. Cause I said that uh, the temperance movement was also entwined with the, uh, with the women's suffrage movement. Cause women worked on both. So um, whatever happens to temperance? Temperance gets important again in, 19, in the early 1900s, in New Hampshire anyway, and it slides in um, in 1903 when New Hampshire passes what are called local option laws, allowing the municipalities to decide whether or not to license liquor agents. In other words, the, t the state decided on temperance that the towns could decide on temperance. So some places were dry and some places were wet. Uh, Exeter tended to be a dry town. Uh, most of the time they, they would have come up in election after election after election because you could vote on it every year. And generally we went um, the way of the dry 
town. So there were a lot of liquor raids and such going on, or they would license the liquor agents. There'd only be one person in town that could sell liquor. And then everybody else that was selling it out of their basement would be in trouble. 1917, when World War I begins, New Hampshire passes prohibition as part of the war effort, and then they just hold it over long enough for the United States Congress to pass the 18th Amendment, the Prohibition Amendment. And um, once that goes through the following January, New Hampshire stayed dry until 1933 when uh, they withdraw all of it. <laughs> so I want you to keep temperance in the back of your mind because women are working, um, if they weren't working for suffrage, they may have been working for temperance. The two didn't always go together. You weren't always a temperance woman and a suffrage woman. You weren't always an anti-suffrage woman who was all for drinking liquor. It, it could go back and forth. But what it does do is it makes women very much politically active. So we'll keep that in mind. In 1878, the first women's suffrage bill is proposed to the United States Congress. Because I said that voting is set by local governments, which it is, except for federal elections, which could be governed by the United States government. And because of the supremacy clause, if the United States, if the federal government passes some rule or regulation, it has to be uh, adhered to in all of the states. So states could decide how to register voters, how old you had to be to register to vote. But if they passed a, an overriding law in the country, uh, the federal level, then it would have to be abided by by all the states. So suffrage workers were uh, deciding whether or not they wanted to make suffrage a state issue or should they make it a federal issue. And that was a big decision to make because if you were gonna try to amend the constitution, that's a difficult process. It's made difficult on purpose. I'll get to that in a second. Anyway, the 19th amendment as proposed in 1878 was written by Susan B. Anthony of course, she couldn't bring it to the Congress because she is a woman. So it was proposed by Aaron Sargent, um, who brought it in. Here, where is he from? He's from California. Now, it's interesting to note that a lot of the Western states allowed women to vote in many elections at the very uh, from from the late 19th century anyway, because there were not as many women out west. Women tended to own a lot of property. And it was felt that they needed to have a say in what was going on in government. So it was kind of unusual that in some states women had the vote and in other states, it was just no way they're ever gonna let women vote. So this is the entirety of the 19th Amendment. It's really quite short. Um, sometimes it's the shorter the better. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. It was proposed and almost immediately lost. Let's go over, this is just civics teacher Barbie talking. Let's go over how a bill becomes, a, how, how, we, how we amend the constitution, not how a bill becomes the law, but how we amend the constitution. Because there are a few ways of doing this and it can be a little bit confusing if you're looking at it from the outside. The Constitution gives us several ways to amend the Constitution itself, okay? The first thing that has to happen is something called a proposal. The proposal can come from a two-thirds vote of both houses of Congress, so you need two-thirds of the, of the House of Representatives, two-thirds of the Senate. Once that is proposed, it has to be ratified. The other way it can be proposed it can be proposed by a two-thirds vote of a national convention called by Congress on the request of two-thirds of the state legislatures. So in that scenario, if two-thirds of the states in the United States request a national convention, and that national convention has a two-thirds vote that passes it, then it can go to ratification. This option has never been used. That's, that's why you've probably never heard of it. And there's a lot of two thirds in there because when it's majority rule, it's 51% and 51 is what they sometimes call tyranny of the majority. It's like, oh, it's just barely passing. Now I'm stuck with it. Um, so they go with two thirds to make it sound like there's a lot more people participating. Anyway, that's never happened. 
but we have passed it in other ways. Uh, we have ratified in one of these two options. Once the proposal has been made and gets through Congress or a national convention, it then goes to the states. And if it's passed by three quarters of the states, then it is ratified. Or if it is passed by three quarters of special state conventions, as they did with prohibition, the repeal of prohibition, then it is also ratified. So there's, a, there's several processes that have to go through here. Here's how the 19th Amendment finally goes through. 1878, it gets proposed to Congress by Aaron Sargent of California, and it gets voted down. You'll notice it takes nine years for that to happen. That's nine years of it being sent to committees, being discussed, being tabled, being brought back. But you know, most of the time, uh, a proposal to amend the Constitution, there's no timeline on it. So you can keep bringing it back anytime you want and rediscussing it. Uh, but for a long time there, the first nine years, they, they didn't even bring it up for a vote. And then eventually they do, and they vote it down pretty solidly. And um, it sort of disappears. There's a lot that goes on during that time period, however, before it is reintroduced in 1914. The time period between 1874 and 1914, a lot of things happened in the country. And a lot of places, um, a lot of states took it into their own hands to extend the vote to women in various ways. Talk about that in just a minute. It gets reintroduced in Congress in 1914, where it is bitterly fought on both sides. That's the period we're mostly gonna talk about here. And then eventually in 1918, President Wilson, of all people, not a man known for his liberal ideas, um, in many ways, at least not about women, uh, issues his support of it, and they pass it in January of 1919, and they send it off to the states, and the states approve it, as mentioned before, August 18th, um, 1920, and then it becomes law two days later. So what happens before then? I'm going to get back to that one. Let's talk about that long interim period because there's a lot that goes on. There's a big battle among women suffragists as to how we are going to deal with trying to get suffrage moved forward. There's one branch that kind of felt you should, you should do it state by state. So, okay, Wyoming has passed women's suffrage. Fine, that's one state. So maybe if we can get all the states to pass women's suffrage, then women will finally be fully enfranchised. That's a long, hard slog because at this time there were like 36 states. So that was going to take a long time, but it seemed like it would have a lot of local control and that would keep people happy with it. The other idea was perhaps we should, we should move suffrage forward by um, allowing it to go through as a, a federal amendment. And it takes a long time before they try to move it forward in that direction. By the early 20th century, there were really two branches. There's one led by Alice Paul. She was, we always call her the young one. She, she was youngish at this point in time. She had studied, she was also a Quaker like Susan B. Anthony. She had gone to, to um, Great Britain and studied the women's suffrage movement there. In the United Kingdom, there were suffragists dem demeaningly called suffragettes by the press who got very violent they were willing to go all the way for women's suffrage. They did things like bombing mailboxes and um, attacking uh, buildings and just uh, you know being somewhat violent in your face, never letting up. In a way, they were somewhat like terrorists, um, although they didn't hurt people generally. Um, and when they were arrested, they would not submit. They would not just calmly wait for their husbands to pick them up at jail. They would, they would demand to be kept in jail, and then they would go on a hunger strike. So it was a badge of honor to many of these women to have been imprisoned for the cause. Carrie Chapman Catt was, um, she, she was equally radical. Um, she was also not opposed to being arrested for the cause. I don't know that she would have gone as far as to go on a hunger strike. The little uh, prison door pin that you see there on the side was a pin that they used to wear. If you had been imprisoned for any amount of time 
for the suffrage cause, you were allowed to wear one of these pins. There were all sorts of little pins that they wore. This was the era of fraternal organizations and women's organizations, and there was a lot of wearing uh, important jewelry, and they, they certainly took that to heart. You can find a lot of these on eBay today when you go, and a lot of them are reproductions, but anyway. And they marched. Remember how it was unusual for women to speak in public back in the 19th century? When we get to the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, seeing women in public going on marches was still unique. I think this march is actually in New York, and it's actually during the war because they're selling liberty bonds. But um, women began to march, and they began to hold... Uh, I forgot to mention in that last picture, the women who you see on the top are what were called the silent sentinels. And they would stand outside the White House with these signs. Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? They were tolerated before World War I. During the war, they were viewed as, as being disloyal. I mean, it was World War I. You were supposed to pull together for the boys. And here these, these women were out standing in front of the, the president's house protesting silently. And it wasn't just radical women. These could be someone's wife. I mean, can you believe? Uh, you know, back then, a woman was only supposed to appear in the newspaper, you know, three times when she was born, when she was married, and then when she died. Those were the only times that you were supposed to see her name in public. And here were women who were not only willing to stand out in front of people um, on the street, but they were sometimes marching. The only women who marched before this time were, were labor people, you know, people who were fighting for labor unions. The Triangle Shirtwaist women went on strike. I mean, the, the, that was the kind of radical anarchist women that went out there and, and actually marched. And here were women demanding something insane, like the vote. Well, we didn't seem to have a lot of marches or, or uh, big protests here in the state of New Hampshire. What we did seem to have, however, were what we like to do best here. We liked to hold speeches and meetings and get together and discuss these things. And that's what we see in places like Exeter. Now, mind you, by this time, women had gained a little bit of the vote. In 1872, like in a lot of places in the United States, the state of New Hampshire extended um, an invitation to women to participate in the local school boards. School boards were considered within women's role because of course they were supposed to be caring for the children remember they're the moral voices and so it was considered okay for women to participate in school board elections and indeed in exeter let's see if i can find my reference here women began to serve on school boards um we held our first mixed school board meeting in 1879. Women could vote in the local elections. They had to remember that they had to be on the school voting list before they were allowed to come in and vote. And at the first mixed meeting, it was rather funny reading the accounts of it. Uh, first, they didn't think they had enough women there. There were only two or three. And so they sent a group of men out to walk the ladies to the meeting because many of the women hadn't come because they didn't want, they weren't accompanied by anybody. So that's how they came. Our first woman who ever ran for the Exeter School Board was Jeanette Talbot in 1884. And um, Talbot Gymnasium is named for her and her mother. No, her and her daughter, I believe. They both have the same name, so it's hard to tell. But um, she lost. She was defeated uh, very soundly in that election, unfortunately, but she at least did give it a shot. What we're looking at here on the screen right now are some of the arguments that were used to uh, oppose women's suffrage. And if you get a chance to read the Exeter Newsletters accounts, and you have to, I mean, you have to spend 20 or 30 years worth of reading the Exeter Newsletter to do this. So I don't know, we should publish it in a book, I think. Um, but it's fun to read the articles that are put in there. There will be uh, several articles uh, that are written about 
suffrage women, and then there's a few that will be written about the anti-suffrage women. They would hold events, they would hold teas, they would hold uh, speeches, um, and they would talk about women and why they should vote or why they shouldn't vote, which brings us, of course, to this strange phenomenon of the anti-suffrage woman. Who was she? I was so fascinated by this. Um, and you can see that there were meeting after meeting of, of anti-suffragists, and they tended to be attended by the women of what we would consider to be the upper crust, the society ladies, the club ladies. So the, the women who felt that they had some say in what was going on anyway. This is the diary of Helen Tuft, who was 14 years old in 1912. 1912 was a big year for suffrage. They were really discussing it a lot. Um, they had previously tried to pass an amendment to the New Hampshire State Constitution in 1902 uh, to allow, to include women in the voting rights, but it fell in defeat, but not by as much as you'd think. It came very near close to passing in many places. Even in Exeter, the vote was quite close. And so in the following 10 or 15 years, it, it really heated up. So anyway, Helen is 14 years old, and she goes to hear some uh, suffrage anti-suffrage ladies speak at the town hall i love the way she wrote this in here um says went to town hall with mother and jim to hear two ladies speak on anti-suffrage very good i'm an anti so she is 14 years old she is very excited to be an anti-suffrage person her father was one of the professors at the phillips exeter academy he would later go into the new hampshire state senate so politics were something that i think they heard a lot about in her house um, but here she is, and she and her mother were definitely on the anti side. Why was this? Okay. Here's the reasons why the, the women who were for suffrage felt that they should be allowed to vote. Votes for women. Um, and, and these make so much sense to us today, you can't imagine that you would ever say otherwise. Those who obey the laws should help to choose those who make the laws. That kind of makes sense. It, laws affect women as much as men. Laws which affect women are now passed without consulting them. Laws affecting children should include the woman's point of view as well as the man's. Laws affecting the home are voted on in every session of the legislature. See, they're, they're building on that idea that a woman's role in the world is, is raising the children and being in the home. So they're building on that. Women have experience which would be helpful to legislation. To deprive women of the vote is to lower their position in common estimation. Having the vote would increase the sense of responsibility among women toward questions of public importance. Public-spirited mothers make public-spirited sons and daughters. You know it would be and daughters too, but they didn't put that there. About 8 million women in the United States are wage workers, and the conditions under which they work are controlled by law. The objections against their having the vote are based on prejudice and not on reason, and it is for the common good for all. Now, all of these things make sense to us today, um, although today we probably would say that, well, issues of the home also affect men, <laughs> and that laws affecting children also should be decided on by men as well as women, so we would have to extend that today. But the language is there. You can see how they're taking the, the common beliefs of the time, and they're trying to push their agenda forward in, in those regards. Um, they don't mention that women are taxpayers, but that was in there. To oppose women's suffrage, um, the, the anti-suffrage women would put out pamphlets such as this one. This is hysterical. Uh, I love this piece. It's a, it's a little, it's two-sided, so I'm going to have to flip it to the other side in a moment so you can see. But um, it's, some, it's disguised as household hints so that you can learn how to take care of your house. Um, and you're also going to get a fair shot of uh, anti-suffrage propaganda in the middle of it. And they're, they're going to say, here's why you should vote now, okay? 90% of women either do not want it or do not care. Now, where they got that number from, no one knows. Uh, probably they just pulled it out of the air because 90% of the women does not sound like the amount of women that really cared. Because it means competition of women with men instead of cooperation because we all know that's how it works. Because 80% of the women eligible to vote are married and could only double or annul their husband's votes. Because it can be of no benefit 
commensurate with the additional expenses involved. A lot of people would oppose women voting by saying, now we're gonna have to print double the amount of ballots. I mean, there's thriftiness and then there's just being cheap, right? Okay, um, because in some states, more voting women than voting men will place the government under petticoat rule. <laughs> because it is unwise to risk the good we already have for the evil which may occur. Oh, my goodness. Um, so much to worry about here. I mean, those poor men, they, they might be outvoted by uh, the fact that there are more women than men, and that would be just terrible. However, on the inside, it's it, this whole uh, little flyer is trying to simply be something that is telling you household hints on how to take care of your home. However, um, some of them are very, very, very snarky. I think what I love about the suffrage movement in the United States to a large degree is the frivolity and a lot of the, the, the joking that goes on back and forth. The um, political cartoons during this time period are really quite fun. Common sense and common salt applications stop hemorrhaging quicker than ballots. Clean houses and clean homes, which cannot be provided by legislation, keep children healthier and happier than any number of uplift laws. There is, however, no method known by which mud-stained reputations may be cleansed after bitter, bitter political campaigns. <laughs> so as they're moving forward here, <laughs> they're trying very hard to keep men, women out of the fray. And most of the time, the arguments that were made against allowing women the vote was that women didn't want to be pulled down into the dirty, muddy, mucky mire that is politics. I mean, these were things that men should be worrying about. They should be worrying about tariffs and, and unseemly things like taxation and, you know, all of this, this I mean, women just didn't have the time in her life to worry about all of these political things. Let the men take care of that. We're busy at home cleaning their shirts so they can go out to a meeting. The women fired back, the suffragists fired back and said, here's why we oppose votes for men. Because a man's place is in the army. Because no really manly man wants to settle any question otherwise than by fighting about it. Because if a man should adopt peaceable methods, women will no longer look up to them. Because men will lose all their charm if they step, if they step part of their natural sphere and interest themselves in other matters than feats of arms, uniforms, and drums. But the one I think is the real kicker is because men are too emotional to vote. Their conduct at baseball games and political conventions shows this, while their innate tendency to appeal to force renders them particularly unfit for the task of government. So one of the things I really love about the suffrage movement at this time is some of the humor that you find in it. By August, in early August, 1920, uh, here's where we stood. This is actually after Congress and the Senate have passed the proposal and it goes out to the states. And in August of 1920, with a presidential election looming, so think of this as exactly where we are right now, okay? We know we have a big election that's coming up. We're actually speaking to you tonight from the, the first night of the Democratic Convention. Um, so it's, it's that close and they're feeling some urgency and we weren't there yet. We were so close. Some states had granted women certain rights, like in New Hampshire, women could vote in some local elections, but they still couldn't vote for the state legislature and they couldn't vote in the federal government. Other places like uh, you know, some of the states out west, Nevada, Utah, Montana, women had been voting all along, Wyoming, um, and it was hoped that these western states would influence the eastern states. But look at where the real block is, where there's absolutely no chance of suffrage. It is in those eastern and southern states where you see it really pushing against it. One of the um, regrettable parts of the women's suffrage movement is the fact that there were women's organizations in the south that were really pushing for women's suffrage, black women's organizations in the south that were really pushing for um, for suffrage and in order to pass any kind of suffrage legislation in the south the women's organizations, the white women's organizations primarily from the north 
had to suppress those because there was a great deal of fear that if, I mean, allowing black people to vote was something that had been allowed by the constitution, but completely suppressed by Jim Crow laws, by making it impossible for um, black people to register to vote, either because there was a, a burdensome poll tax, I and mean, we had poll taxes up here, so that wasn't too unusual, or making sure that there were uh, reading requirements, um, you know, there were all manner, and plus, you know, dangerous intimidation that could also happen as well. So keeping, suppressing the black vote in the South was very important because the uh, white population knew that they could be outvoted and they, there was just no way they were going to let that happen. So there had to be some sort of uh, way of making sure that in the South, the idea that black women might vote had to be in many ways suppressed. So from that, um, the suffrage movement had a tendency to try to eliminate or marginalize black women who were fighting for the same thing. And you see that again and again, including that big march in Washington, D.C. that I was talking about that happened in uh, the, uh, the parade in 1913. Um, the women wanted to march, black women wanted to march, and they were sent to the back. So that happens again and again. And in many respects, you could say that um, the, the suffrage movement does kind of throw black women under the bus. In New Hampshire, here's our timeline for New Hampshire. And um, I talked about the school board meetings, suffrage laws. What turns the tide in New Hampshire are, are the number of organizations that begin to pile on that support women's suffrage. And again, we're, we're talking women mostly white women's suffrage. Although the black population in New England had gone steadily down so that by 1920, there are like 4,500,000 people in the state with only 621 people who are of African descent listed on the census. So you can see it's a very small part of our population by the 1920s when the vote finally goes through. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, so the, um, in New Hampshire, they, they allow women to vote in school board meetings. And then the, the women's suffrage movement kind of peters out for a long time. And it begins to revive around 1901. And who comes back but Armenia White, <laughs> who by this time is quite elderly. But uh, she reinvigorates it. Um, she, she is led by Carrie Chapman. Cat again from New York State, and they reactivate things. In 1902, the New Hampshire Constitutional Convention, it suggests the word male be stricken from the suffrage clause. Um, they speak at the, um, at the actual um, convention, which is held in Concord. They propose the clause revision. Uh, the, the state passed it, but then when it goes to the towns, it falls, even in New Hampshire. It only loses by 15, 20 votes, I think. It's not very much. Um, but but it got closer than it had ever gotten before. And they saw that as being a, a way that they could possibly work harder. You know, sometimes you don't quite win, but you get closer. And it's like, maybe we can keep working on this. And they gained a lot of support from other organizations. Um, they went out and spoke, for instance, the New Hampshire uh, president, Mary Chase, speaks at the Granges across the state. Now, we tend to think about the Grange as this sort of uh, seems like a, a farmer's organization, seems like it would be very conservative, but the Grange was not ever a conservative organization. Like Quakers, they allowed women to have complete ability to speak in their groups and hold um, office in their groups. They were actually a very progressive organization. She spoke to the Grange and the Grange jumps on board. The, the New Hampshire Grange endorses women's suffrage. The New Hampshire Greater Federation of Women's Clubs endorses women's suffrage. And these were club women. These were just the women who usually were in the anti-suffrage movement because they were the workers. Um, the women who were in the, the upper realms, those, those aristocratic kind of women who were in uh, society tended to think that they already had a lot of sway over what went on. They knew what went on in this town. They took care of, uh, you know, of the working people. They knew where the charities were that they could contribute to. And, you know, they didn't need any more any more uh, influence as far as they were concerned, except they did, okay? 
Suffrage gets endorsed in 1907 by the New Hampshire Federation of Labor. In 1907, Frances Smith is elected to the Exeter School Board. She is elected to the Exeter School Board, the first woman ever elected to a town office. She serves until 1921, and that is before women even have the right to vote. 1909, 310 women registered to vote in the Exeter School election which is pretty good. I mean, we're working at, I mean, the population of the town at that point in time is probably about 3,500 people. So 310 women registered to vote is pretty darn good. Suffrage gets endorsed by the New Hampshire Women's Christian Temperance Union. Remember I said temperances didn't always, didn't always carry over, but it did this time. It's endorsed by the New Hampshire Universalist Convention. 1911, the Free Will Baptists join. 1916, unfortunately, saw the death of Armenia White at the age of 95. She got so close to seeing it all the way through, uh, but we lost a great leader that year. In 1919, when the United States Congress is debating whether women's suffrage should come in, the New Hampshire Senate sends a message to the U.S. Congress opposing the suffrage amendment. <laughs> June 4th, Congress sends a proposed amendment to the states. And um, this is how quickly it happens. New Hampshire Senate sends a message to Congress to say, no, don't vote for suffrage. And then on June 4th, Congress votes for suffrage. <laughs> and they send it off to New Hampshire. And then in September, New Hampshire ratified the 19th Amendment. Um, we weren't the first state to ratify the, the uh, 19th Amendment, but we, we were right in the pack of the earlier ones to do it because it doesn't pass nationally for another year. But we passed it in... Uh, September 10th, 1919. Now, there were no big elections that year. It was not very risky at all. It gave us plenty of time to get used to this idea because the first election that it was going to have an impact on would be the town meetings where you didn't have to register to go vote there. Back then, when you voted in your town meetings, you basically raised your hand. And then for the first general election, or actually our first state election was the New Hampshire primary election, the one that we have coming up in just a few weeks. That was the first election in the state of New Hampshire where women had to, fully had to register to vote. Here's Helen Tufts, September 10th, 1919. Her father is in the, US, the uh, New Hampshire Senate. And her diary says, father fought it, spoke, et cetera. But New Hampshire passed the suffrage amendment. Worst luck. The Senate passed it 18 to 10, and her father, um, James Arthur Tufts, voted against suffrage in the New Hampshire Senate because they were an anti-suffrage family. What a difference a year makes. A year later, when it's time to vote in the New Hampshire primary, took mother and me down to vote. My first ex ever put on a ballot was for father for state senator. <laughs> the first vote she ever made was to vote for her father, who a year earlier had voted to prevent her from voting. Because that's what people are like. <laughs> Helen stayed a very active participant in the political world for the remainder of her life. She's 23 the first time she gets to vote, and she stays politically active for the rest of her life. This is one of those funny picture postcards that came up during the battle. Um, here's this poor emasculated man doing laundry. The poor man, can you believe it? Men shouldn't have to do laundry. Because why? I don't know. Anyway, uh, poor father. And um, here are the women who are playing cards and smoking cigarettes and eating chocolates, which sounds like a great day. It looks like a book club, only it's with playing cards instead of books. But oh, poor man. Um, the men survived, <clears throat> as we know. But a lot of women didn't get the vote in 1920. A lot of women. Uh, those African-American women living in the South that I mentioned earlier who worked so hard to try and gain the vote but were shut out by the white suffrage, suffrage movement, um, get shut out by Jim Crow's laws just like many of their husbands and fathers and brothers. And so they're prevented from voting for a long time until 1965, actually, when the Voting Rights Act passed. Native American women weren't granted citizenship until 1924. 
In fact, um, you don't even see women, um, you don't see uh, indigenous populations even listed on the US census until about 1900. So this, this was a group of people who were considered quite separate from the general population of the United States. And therefore the question of whether they were citizens and were they covered by the um, laws of the United States was always questioned. Asian American women were not allowed citizenship until the end of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1943. They also fought hard to get birthright citizenship because their uh, parents were never allowed to become citizens. And so for that reason, Asian American women, um, originally just Chinese, but eventually Chinese, Japanese, and anyone coming from Asia were not allowed any kind of citizenship until 1943, which is really, really recent. Um, so when we say that women were granted the right to vote in 1920, and when we go and cast our ballots or mail in our ballots in this election, this year, when it's the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, I want you to just take a moment and remind yourself that this wasn't all women and that it took even more work for um, all women in the United States to gain the vote. So let's keep that in mind as we, as we move forward, um, especially if you, like me, are a white woman going out there and voting. Keep in mind that a lot of our fellow women uh, were still not allowed to vote. I love this quote from Tammy Brown, um, which I found online. The history of women's suffrage in America is not a nice or neat because the impact of white supremacy is broad and human nature is messy. Furthermore, a nation built on stolen land from Native Americans and stolen labor from African slaves is flawed from the start. We must constantly acknowledge this truth and engage in an intersectional celebration of women's rights, activists, and landmark events. And I also want to acknowledge all the women um, in, in Exeter in particular. I write about women a lot, and I write about women who do remarkable things, um, and some of them you know, I didn't live long enough to see women's suffrage come through. Women who ran banks and uh, did remarkable things in town and simply didn't get as far as being able to vote. And I always remember them as well because they were cheated out of that for so long. Okay, I'm gonna open it up for questions. I'll take off my sharing screen here. If I can, stop share. Come back to where we are. <laughs> I wanna remind you all that you can vote by absentee ballot. <laughs> You still have time to do that. The New Hampshire primary, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold up the flyer that you should have gotten in the mail. All right, you're gonna get this flyer in the mail if you haven't gotten it yet. And it's voting information specifically for this year because this year is a very strange year. It's uh, you know, a year where we have COVID out there and you can apply for an absentee ballot. It's quite a simple process. I've already done it. I already voted in the New Hampshire primary. So you just go out to your town website and you go to the town clerk's office and click on that and request an absentee ballot. It comes within a day or two. And then you fill it out, you sign it and you send it in. Uh, you'll get an envelope that looks like this in the mail. I'm covering up my husband's name because he hasn't voted yet, but this is his ass. <laughs> um, and, and you can fill it out and send it in. So if you're concerned about your poll takers or yourself this year, you can vote by absentee ballot. You simply check off the part that talks about uh, disability, which for this year is all of us. So uh, that counts this year. Okay, I'm gonna open it for questions if we have any. And I'll take those through Jillian. Have we seen anybody asking any questions? I have not. I noticed we have a bit of a smaller group tonight. I know it's Monday. We usually do programs on Tuesday, so it's different. But if you guys have questions at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a Q&A section and you can type questions in there. And also, if you're watching on Facebook, I see there's a couple of you. You can leave questions in that comment section as well. Um, I did have a question there for you, Barbara. When you said Francis Smith becoming the first woman on the school board, um, this would be, she is from the, the same Smith family that we hear about constantly going all the way back at the beginning of Exeter or no? You know, I haven't run her genealogy, John. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just wondering. She was There's a lot of Smiths out there. Yeah, I know. So she's an <laughs> Uh, it's it's quite possible. She was a, uh, I believe she was a teacher actually, and that's probably what got her interested in oh. being on the school board. Yeah. Excellent. Now Alexa is here with a question. And wants oh. to know what Helen Tufts did in her later political involvement 
And was she active in trying to get the vote taken away from women again? Or was that even a thing that... I have never heard of uh, them trying to remove the vote. The problem is, you know, once you hand somebody rights, it is awfully hard to take them back again. And I doubt very much that she would be involved in that. I did have this fascinating picture I found in the Exeter newsletter in the 1950s, which was of a woman who was voting and she was in her 90s. And she, this was something like her eighth election they said that she voted in. And she said she voted in every election, including municipal elections, but um, she really didn't think that women should be voting because it was such a bother. <laughs> it was the oddest quote I've ever seen. A politically active woman who was saying that maybe we didn't have to do it. I mean, I would agree with that on something like grocery shopping. You know, I don't like doing it, but I have to. I, I think that was kind of the way <laughs> she thought about voting. Uh, it's the only thing I could think of. Um, as far as I know, Helen Tufts, who, who was better known as Betty Tufts or Betty Krieger to most people in town because she marries later on, and uh, she was a piano teacher. And for the, as best I know, she stayed politically active her whole life. We could ask um, Jonathan Ring is, is here and he, he might know it was, it was his aunt. I don't know if we're gonna hear from him. We'll see if he uh, <laughs> sends in any information in this Q and A box. But in the meantime, Karen says no questions, but thank you for the discussion and for the final words about who could vote in the 1920s and later. And also thank you for promoting voting. Ah, okay. I think there's one from Stacy. There is, yes, that just came in. Okay. How did women generally vote politically? Um, like which party would they lean towards, do you know? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, New Hampshire and Exeter were solidly Republican town for a long time. I don't think it has begun to shift until like the 1990s. So my best guess on that, and I don't have the stats, but I'm gonna say, if we look at the general population of, of Exeter, they were probably voting Republican. Uh, that was the party of Abraham Lincoln, which, you know, uh, Exeter has some clear ties to the Republican Party, so they were always very involved in that. And this continues even through the uh, platform swap in the 60s? Uh, like I said, it begins to shift in the 1990s, I believe it is. Yeah. Somebody from one of the political parties out there who might know the answer to that question. By the way, a lot of the women that were involved in the women's suffrage campaigns joined the League of Women Voters after um, suffrage passes. And there's a lot of movement to make sure that women know how to register to vote and what the process is like. Many women hadn't done it before. And in the elections that they had voted in, particularly in New Hampshire, school board elections, uh, generally they weren't elections that were done by ballot. Those were the old town meeting kind of style where everybody just raised their hand and they counted. So when it came to actually filling out a ballot, women did have to learn the process for doing that. League of Women Voters is still very active. They're nonpartisan. So they're a good place to go if you wanna find out about the candidates and you, you don't wanna like listen to your relatives or someone that you ran into at work or something like that. You know, if you want a good unbiased opinion, the League of Women Voters is still the way to go. John Ring has come into the Q&A box and says, Aunt Betty voted straight Republican ticket to the best of his knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I knew she would. <laughs> yeah, just you know, vote for her father's party. Yep, she right. would. Yeah, they were a very politically active family. Uh, you know, the Tufts were involved in local elections um, and state elections for a long time in politics as, as well. So I'm not surprised at all she was state active. Yeah. All right, Michelle asks, do we know what kind of voting activism was generated by mill workers in the town? Ooh, we do not, because we don't have the voting rolls available for us. Um, I don't know. I, I, don't, I couldn't even venture a guess on that one, but that would be an interesting question to pursue. I know that um, um, of the women who were eligible to vote, not all of them did vote, because the question is, you know, after they pass women's suffrage, do all of the women who were anti-suffragists then stay home and say, I'm not gonna vote because I'm opposed to that? And, um, you know, although there were women that did stay home and not vote, it doesn't seem like the anti-suffragists um, refused voting any more than the women who were in favor of suffrage. Um, after all, the odd thing about the whole situation is that in opposing the vote for women, um, the anti-suffragists actually had to politicize themselves to oppose it. So because they were very involved in politics on that one issue, they, they kind of stayed involved in politics. And you could do that through an organization like the League of Women Voters, where you were nonpartisan. Odd. <laughs> 
this pose a related question to the mill workers. We know many of the mill workers were immigrants. And it, so a question related to this would be how many of the mill workers who were immigrants did become citizens and were eligible to vote as well. That's true. Uh, that's true. That many of the mill workers weren't American citizens, and until the vote get until women's suffrage gets passed, there was very little incentive for women to become U.S. citizens. And there, there was no reason for it. Um, you know, they had to pass a citizenship test and and prove they could read and write in English, and those were hard. So um, if they weren't given citizenship directly through their husband, um, what incentive was there for a woman to become a U.S. citizen? So a lot of times they, they just didn't, so they didn't vote. Oh, well, we have a couple more. Alexa has come back. Uh, mentioned <laughs> southern groups of women of color advocating for their votes. Uh, you said women of color were a small group in New Hampshire at the time and still are. So was there a separate movement in New Hampshire? For black I have women. not heard of one. That's a question I think we'd need to toss to um, um, perhaps Portsmouth or Manchester, where there were higher concentrations of African American women. Although Exeter had a higher percentage of African Americans living here after the American Revolution, that particular population tends to um, disappear after a while. There are very few African Americans living in Exeter in the early 1900s. So I don't think there were probably enough people to have started a movement. That's my best guess. Question is, you know, when does the NAACP come in and start to push forward as well? And did they actually support women's suffrage? Um, those are all questions we'd need to pursue in the future. Dorothy says uh, her great grandmother in Hopkins in New Hampshire was on the school board from 1896 to 1907, and at the end was on the head of, the, and she was the head of the school board at the end. So good for her. Good job <laughs> to Dorothy's great grandmother. I'm not seeing anything over on Facebook or YouTube. I know we had a couple people watching over there, and they've sent us some likes, so that's very kind. <laughs> Thank you for the hitting the like button. We like that. All right, that's all I am seeing currently in our Q&A. All right, well, if you wake up at 3 a.m. and you've got a burning question that you need to have answered, you can send it to us directly at our email address, info at exeterhistory.org, or you can send it through Facebook, um, and we'd be happy to try to get you out an answer within the next few days. Sometimes these questions even prompt a, an interesting newspaper article. So I'm always glad to hear from people and get ideas. And your uh, inquiries always help with that. So I appreciate it. Yes, thank you everyone who came out. We appreciate you. Have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Don't forget to vote. <laughs>